Good afternoon. It's my privilege to um, start off the second panel of the afternoon. Before I do that, I just want to embarrass Mark. Mark, turn around. Um, and for those of you who weren't able to join us in San Diego, I just want to let everyone know who wasn't there that uh, Mark received this year the 2010 Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. And so while we're celebrating many things today in this conference is in memory of uh, Dr. Tulman, who was very influential in Mark's career. So on that note, can we give a round of applause to Mark, who has no idea that I've said anything. Um, so uh, the, this afternoon's panel is going to be about health disparities and domestic health policy. And our first speaker is going to be one of my colleagues here at the University of Chicago as a faculty member in the McLean Center. And Marshall is a professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine here. Uh, he received his MD from University of California, San Francisco, and his MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. And he currently investigates how to improve the care and outcomes of vulnerable patients with chronic disease. And his current project seeks to improve diabetes care in community health centers and improve access to treatment preferences of older persons with diabetes. He's director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Finding Answers, Disparities Research for Change. And today he'll be talking to us about current challenges in reducing racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Dr. Chen. Thanks, Lady. And thanks to Mark for inviting me to speak. That, uh, you know, this annual conference, as well as the yearly seminar series, I think truly are the best uh, interdisciplinary seminars and conferences on, on campus. And so it's, it's great to be a part of the community here. Um, in, the, in the program, the, the title in the program is Current Challenges in Reducing Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. But actually, it's, it's more promising than that, in that we do know some things in terms of solutions. And so the title is amended to Lessons and Current Challenges. And what I'm going to focus on is what we do know now in terms of what can work within the healthcare system for reducing racial genetic disparities in care. Okay. So here's the roadmap for the talk. I'm going to briefly tell you about our Robert Wood Johnson program, Finding Answers, Disparities, Research for Change. I'm going to discuss the conceptual model that underlies our work for thinking about disparity reduction. I'm going to talk about six key components for efforts to reduce disparities go through what we know from a systematic review of the literature about what works for reducing disparities, talk about lessons from our grantees, and then I'll end with, uh, in some ways, a setup for Eric Whitaker's talk, talking a little bit about integrating healthcare system and community approaches. So Finding Answers, it's a national program of the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation uh, that's based at the University of Chicago. We have three main goals. Uh, so one is we give out money. In particular, we give out grants to organizations that are doing evaluations of practical solutions for reducing racial and ethnic disparities in care. We conduct systematic reviews of literature to understand what works for reducing disparities. And then increasingly, we ent we're entering a dissemination phase in terms of disseminating results to encourage healthcare systems on a regional and national basis to reduce disparities. So we provide information about what works and what doesn't and then we're creating resources and toolkits that organizations can use in their efforts. So here's the conceptual model. So you can see these two big bubbles. On the left-hand side, you have a person embedded in their community. If they have access to care, they become a patient who interacts with a provider within a healthcare organization. At the top, you have a policy infrastructure. So the big hammer is financing, in terms of uh, uh, Medicare or Medicaid, for example. Um, this regulation, and so as uh, people in the audience like Preston Reynolds know, uh, one of the key elements for reducing the segregation in hospitals was the Civil Rights Act of 64. And you have accreditation, so you have organizations like such as JCO and, and some of the uh, training organizations using the accreditation tool as an effort to both incentivize and use as a hammer for reducing disparities. And then ultimately at the bottom you have then these different aspects affecting processes of care and outcomes. So a couple years ago, Hal Sox, who at that time was the editor of the Annals of Internal Medicine, invited me to write an editorial. And he said, it's actually a golden opportunity. He said that, well, you know, I don't want you to write about this particular article in the uh, journal, but just to use the editorial as an opportunity to talk about what you think are the key components for reducing disparities. And so basically came up with these six different components I want to share with you. 
So the first is uh, increasing emphasis uh, nationally, um, which is basically examining your performance data, stratified by insurance status, race, ethnicity, language, and socioeconomic status. Uh, for those of you who point through like the, the details of the health care reform bill, uh, this increasing incentive in terms of uh, the collection of race, ethnicity, and language data. The second is getting training for your staff to work effectively with diverse populations. And actually, one more point about the first point. The point about the first one is really, it basically prepares people to change and improve. So in other words, people don't believe that there are problems in terms of disparities in their own organization and practice until they look at their own data. And then when they see their own data and they see the disparities, then they motivate the change. The second point here is getting training for your staff to work effectively with diverse populations. You know, a lot of different medical schools and, and nursing schools, they have a cultural competency training programs, but it really goes beyond cultural competency. The Society for General Internal Medicine, they have a nice uh, paper where they talk about what the goals should be for a course in health disparities, and they come up with four different components. One is the existence of disparities, ideologies, and solutions, so basically awareness. Work then looking at issues of mistrust, subconscious bias in trainees and stereotyping, communication and trust building, and then fourth, commitment to reducing disparities. So we're lucky at the University of Chicago that uh, one of our faculty members, Monica Vella, uh, leads what is perhaps the premier course in the country for medical students on health disparities. And uh, she led a great session for this year's ethics fellows uh, discussing training in terms of how do you train uh, trainees to think about disparities issues. I just want to share some of the things that makes her, her course innovative. So one is that there are these self-insight exercises, which basically help people understand their own attitudes toward disparities and their, and their own potentially self, uh, subconscious uh, biases. There are field trips and basically um, sessions in terms of the Chicago history of disparities. And one of the most highly rated lecturers, for example, was a talk by a historian on um, disparities issues on the South Side. There's a group disparities project where people work on trying to improve some disparities aspect um, in Chicago. There are reflective essays and discussion. This uh, basically is a way to basically have people discuss these issues in a confidential but um, straightforward way. This discussion about individual patient care, like working with interpreters, as well as policy, in terms of like Medicare policy. Uh, and one thing she does is that um, she draws upon an extensive uh, group of instructors, many from the McLean Center, who are particularly skilled at uh, discussing challenging topics like ethics and race. So the third key component is making reduction of inequities in care for vulnerable populations an integral component of quality improvement efforts. So when I give this talk outside of Chicago, uh, I showed this slide, and I asked people, well, who knows who Bud Bilkin is? And to date, no one has been able to identify who Bud Bilkin is. But uh, this audience, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who do know. And so it turns out Bud Bilkin is a fictional character. Uh, it was created by uh, one of the African-American newspapers, Chicago Defender. Um, and there was an annual parade that uh, we're aware of here on the South Side, the Bud Bilkin Parade, which is the largest African-American parade in the country. But the reason why I have a slide is that each year in the Chicago, in the Chicago Medical Center newsletter, there is either this photo or something uh, comparable, which is basically the university uh, float and the university presence at the Bud Billiken Parade. Now, I think community engagement is an important thing and a very valuable thing. Um, probably a lot of us here in the audience uh, participate in a variety of community health affairs, and you know, many of us get our children involved at an early stage in terms of community events. However, if this was the only thing the University of Chicago was doing in terms of disparities and community efforts, ergo would be the problem. Now, Eric's going to talk more about this in a moment in terms of uh, how sort of we're integrating efforts the, at the university with community efforts. But the point is that disparities can't be sort of a marginalized activity. It needs to be a part of all of our efforts to think about quality. So again, many of you in the audience are familiar with the so-called IOM-6, the Institute of Medicine's six pillars of quality that were reported in their book on the quality chasm. Uh, what probably many of you are not aware of is that in the past year, the IOM has basically revised that framework. And here's the new framework. You see here the, uh, the first column is basically the new pillars in terms of effectiveness, safety, timeliness, patient and family centeredness, access, efficiency. The other columns show the continuum of care, preventive care, acute treatment, chronic care. What you see on the left here, you have two cross cutting dimensions. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, I thought I was getting sort of the early hook here. <laughs> but it's actually, what is the, uh, well, anyway, it's, it's not working here with the light here. But you see, um, there's, <laughs> thanks, Mark. <laughs> Um, basically, equity and value were thought to be, in some ways, the most important dimensions, which really are cross-cutting dimensions, which cut across all those other elements of quality. 
So thinking about equity in all of our different quality efforts. Four is providing models of care and infrastructure support to enable organizations to improve the quality of care for vulnerable patients. And here's where we, we, come, here's where we come in as academics in terms of trying to create these models of care. Fifth is aligning incentives to reward providers and health organizations for providing high quality care for vulnerable populations. And I think that um, Harold will probably talk more about that. Um, let's skip that. Six is allocating more resources for the uninsured with chronic diseases. So one of the things I mentioned in terms of funding answers is that we do these systematic reviews of the literature in terms of what works for reducing disparities. And so at this point, uh, we've reviewed over 200 articles for seven different conditions. And we're currently involved in a, a number of other conditions, including um, a variety of people in the audience working on new, new projects. But when you look at, I guess, the 200 articles, it's actually hard to come up with cross-cutting generic lessons. And uh, here's what we came up with in terms of trying to think about these, these general lessons from the literature. Well, one was that multifactorial interventions that address multiple leverage points along a patient's pathway of care tend to be more effective if you're trying to improve outcomes. Because basically, any barrier along the way is enough to derail an outcome improvement. And because the causes of disparities are multifactorial, the solutions have to be multifactorial. Culturally tailored quality improvement tends to be better than generic quality improvement. And there's a lot of evidence for nurse-led interventions with multiple disciplinary teams and close tracking and monitoring patients. Part of that is the attention. Part of that, I think, is the case management in terms of really looking at all these different aspects that will affect the patient. When you look at the pediatric literature, sort of an homage to uh, uh, Lenny here, look at asthma care and immunizations, a few more recommendations. It's important to look at the structural aspects of care experience and impact outcomes. So for example, the medical home, a different, as an example of a structural aspect, incorporating families and interventions, and integrating non-healthcare partners into QI interventions. So this next part of the talk, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about like a variety of different uh, example solutions. Um, you know, for our Finding Answers program, we have grantees now from 33 different parts of the country. Uh, so our new map would include Florida and Miami, as an example, in Northern California. So we have sort of a diverse set of grantees. And one of our charges is to work with another Robert Wood Johnson program called Aligning Forces for Quality. And then these little um, yellow dots you see on the map are two different target communities and states where we're charged with working with these communities to improve care and reduce disparities. So they include like Seattle, Albuquerque, Memphis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, state of Minnesota, state of Wisconsin, the state of Maine, Boston, this Pennsylvania area. So a variety of different places. And when you look at our 28 now 33 grantees, here are the common lessons, and then we'll go through some examples. One is that knowledge, attitude, and interventions are helpful but not sufficient. Disparity data interventions are helpful but not sufficient. Context and tailoring are critical. And then the importance of multifactorial, multi-target interventions, and also the importance of looking at buy-in, incentives, sustainability, and systems issues. So knowledge, attitudes, and data are helpful but not sufficient. Harvard or Vanguard did the cultural competency training program and then disparity report cards where individual doctors were fed back their own quality data stratified by race and ethnicity. The result, increased acknowledgement of disparities, but no change in clinical outcomes. Morehouse, health literacy training, health literacy screening. Uh, one third of the patients in their uh, study had limited health literacy. What was the outcome? Again, physicians were more aware of literacy issues, but there was no change in the actual clinical outcomes. So these are both examples of where it's important for awareness training, importance for readiness to change, but in and of themselves, this type of training and data are insufficient for changing clinical outcomes. So what are some other uh, interventions? Well, for example of a provider system intervention, um, West Five is a health center in New York State, concurrent peer review, simple intervention. Basically, you have one of your colleagues to a second opinion upon your care. Um, it was a show that decreased blood pressure, increased medication intensification, there was widespread provider report, and it's reimbursable. Provider patient interventions. So the variety of our interventions uh, are basically looking at uh, nurse and uh, phone-based peer support. So at Duke and UPenn, um, over-the-phone medication management, behavior modification, phone-based peer support. It's an example, though, of where context and tailoring are key. So we need an example of telephone. We have two of our grantees where the telephone has worked, and two of our grantees where it hasn't worked. And I think a priori you would have a hard time figuring out which ones would have worked and not. So University of Pennsylvania, I already mentioned that one, peer-based phone support, University of Arizona, a lot of rural patients are just using video telephone conferencing to do uh, sort of psychiatric, psychiatric counseling long distance through this type of telephone uh, depression intervention. Those worked. Areas where it didn't work, 
uh, Medicaid Health Plan in Rhode Island uh, to health on care management for the Latino population. Didn't work. Mobile County in Alabama, um, glucose monitoring, cell phone text, uh, um, texting, and phone management didn't work. Both of these interventions, African American, Latino, diabetes, hypertension, two worked, two didn't. So it's the importance of context and tailoring. Community health workers, um, UC Irvine, it worked. Uh, patient activation, empowering patients to play a more active role in their care, reduce uh, A1C. Choctaw, Indian tribe in Oklahoma, community health workers didn't work. And one of the issues there was that it's a very verbal culture. And so uh, some of the training that was involved in terms of the uh, health worker intervention um, perhaps was not adequately adapted for that particular culture. Mass the community health centers in Massachusetts, health workers didn't work. Uh, patient intervention. So one of our best ones is uh, Cooper Green, which is the Strozier Hospital of uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, they have patient narratives on DVD looking at a variety of hypertension issues. Giving this DVD out to patients, randomized control trial, lowered blood pressure. A variety of incentives. So Baylor is testing a P4P nationally in the, in the VA system. Cigna, patient incentives for office visits. Aaron E. Henry, a health center in the Delta in Mississippi, uh, patient incentives for reaching weight, exercise, and medical adherence goal. These are in progress, we don't know the results yet, but again, to show the variety of incentive interventions which are being tried. So again, to summarize, the lessons from the grantees, model interventions are necessary, but ones that need to be tailored to a specific situation. Interventions have to be intensive. Knowledge and data are insufficient. Multifactorial, multi-target interventions are the way to go. It's crucial to look at the process of intervention and the process of implementation, and the importance of looking at buy-in, incentives, sustainability, and system. So this is my last slide, and uh, again, I set it for Eric that um, you know, increasingly in our work here in Chicago, we've come to the realization that it's critical to basically integrate what we do in the healthcare system for reducing disparities with work in the community. We're doing a lot of work with diabetes in particular, and we think that the cutting edge really is this interface in terms of bringing the strengths and assets of the community to the strengths and assets we bring within the healthcare system. And I know Eric will talk a lot more about this, and so we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Like the first panel, we're going to take all questions during the Q&A. We're actually going to change the order because Dr. Whitaker has another commitment, and I just want to make sure that we get to hear at least his talk, and hopefully he'll be able to stay for part of the Q&A. So um, our next speaker will be Dr. Whitaker. Eric Whitaker is the Executive Vice President, Strategic Affiliations, and Associate Dean of Community-Based Research at the University of Chicago Medical Center. He's walking up here because I had to promise I would keep the introduction short. <laughs> He is responsible for leading the uh, university's urban health initiative, linking the medical center's mission of patient care, teaching, and research for the purpose of improving the health of the Southside residents. Uh, Dr. Whitaker graduated Grinnell as an undergraduate. He graduated the University of Chicago Medical Schools and then went on and got his uh, degree in public health from Harvard University. Until 2007, he served as director of the Illinois Department of Public Health, and we are thrilled that he has come back to the university as our executive VP. Eric? Thank you. Um, it, it is a pleasure to be here once again uh, at the McLean Fellows Symposium. Uh, it's been great to be among uh, many of my mentors and role models. Uh, Gene Washington left, and I, I didn't get a chance to tell him. He was suggesting that staying at the, Quad the Quadrangle Club was a bad thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, while I was sitting up there and he was talking, I, I got a text from Chicago Cranes Business that the Four Seasons, in fact, had a fire. <laughs> so so uh, it was a win-win-win for doc, uh, Dr. Washington, and he didn't uh, know it. Uh, I, you know, I want to thank uh, Dr. Siegler for the invitation to be here today. I want to also thank him for in inviting the Urban Health Initiative uh, to be a part of the seminar series for this this uh, uh, year. This up, it, it's, I think we've had probably about five or six. Uh, there will be a total of 28 or 29 lectures looking at health disparities, and we've been excited to be co-host uh, with that process. So I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Siegler. Yeah, in fact, uh, Mark was my first attending when I was a third year medical student and has had an impact on me uh, since that time. You know, so what I, what I have to do in a very short amount of time is to give you uh, a sense of some of the work that, that we've been doing here on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and, you know, you all probably know this famous jurist, uh, Judge Judy. Uh, and given the limitations on time, I wanted to have us stipulate some things much in the, uh, the, the legal manner. 
Uh, one, I think, think the speakers uh, who came before laid a lot of the foundational work for these stipulations. First, you know, th that uh, in health, place matters. You know, where you're born uh, is, is something that, that's important. Uh, also, it's, you know, from all the work that's been presented before, that you know, health status is, is due to many things beyond the healthcare system. And I agree with Dr. Washington that, you know, it, it would be generous to say 20% of health is uh, from healthcare. Uh, and, and, and the last one uh, is, gets at the fact that often when we talk about urban communities, when we think about urban communities, we often think about them from a deficit model. And it's, it's our, our belief that uh, to improve health status on the south side of Chicago, we have to pay attention to place. We also have to look beyond the, the health care or medical model and, and look at other social factors. In fact, you know, you, as, as an, a physician and in, in a, a hospital administrator, I'm talking to grocery stores about citing uh, themselves on the south side of Chicago as a way for economic development and alleviating food deserts, which is something usually not in a hospital administrator's uh, job description. But we think it's an important thing to do if we're to improve health. And lastly, uh, as Marshall mentioned, there are a great many assets in the community, and if we, it would uh, be wise of us to build on those assets to try and improve health. And, and one of the assets that's often underappreciated, underappreciated is actually human assets, the knowledge of the people who live uh, in the communities. And just, just uh, by way of introduction, we call the South Side the darkly uh, demarcated uh, line around the, the 34 community areas. Uh, and it, it constitutes, uh, in our way of thinking, about 34 of the 77 community areas on, uh, you know, in, in the city of Chicago. Uh, this, this is about 1.1 million people, uh, largely Af African American, about 72% African American, uh, and, and it spans the, you know, all over the, the, uh, the, you know, in terms of income status across the, the African American community. We also, within the borders, have a, uh, a Chinatown as well as an area with a largely Latino uh, population called East Side. And I, I probably should have had a, a fourth point to stipulate that on the south side of Chicago in our primary service area, we have a lot of death and disease. Um, you know, uh, if you look to the right, uh, the infant mortality rate for Chicago is about 0.9. And as you can see, those red uh, communities uh, are, you know, with community areas with an infant mortality rate that's higher than both the city and the Illinois average. Uh, to the, the left on the slide, uh, for a number of chronic diseases, heart failure, diabetes, uh, kidney failure, asthma, hypertension, the hospitalization rate on the south side of Chicago is two, two plus times that for the, the state of Illinois as a whole. So that, you know, we, we have a lot of chronic disease and people end up in the hospital for that chronic disease. So this thing called the Urban Health Initiative, uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, build a, a health ecosystem uh, where one doesn't currently exist that's organized and do so in an economically sustainable way. Uh, when I started medical school at Pritzker in 1987, uh, we had a number of hospitals on the south side of Chicago. You know, fast forward to today and we have about seven less hospitals on the south side than when I started medical school here. Uh, and we also believe that if we're to do well in terms of health status, that the community has to be engaged in the process, not have research on the community, or in, in fact, we need to have community fully engaged in conceptualizing the research, carrying it out, and helping to interpret the research. We, we are very mindful we're a research institution and that, in fact, we believe in a number of different domains and uh, that, that research and development is a critical thing if we're to advance uh, science and, and improve and, in fact, develop scalable urban models. Uh, we also, as the University of Chicago and our, our medical school, uh, we're the fourth leading producer of academic physicians in the country. And if we do this well, you know, we'll be able to have a multiplier effect, uh, effect across the countries and medical schools uh, all over the U.S. And lastly, uh, much to uh, the work that Marsha has been doing, you know, we want to help create and learn from other models and create new models that can be used in this country and, in fact, uh, throughout the world. And we've, we've uh, talk about systems, science, and service, and trying to develop uh, the, the uh, research in all of these elements. First, in terms of the system, 
you know, we have created something called the Southside Healthcare Collaborative that builds on the work of First Lady Michelle Obama, uh, who at the time she was here, maybe about uh, six years ago or so, uh, started a collection of community health centers. There were 18 at that time that was trying to find medical homes for the 40% of patients in our emergency room who uh, really should not have been in our emergency room but had primary care problems. Uh, that effort has, has grown to now 33 community health centers uh, and five hospitals. So on the south side of Chicago, we have all of the, these individuals around one table talking about quality, talking about access to subspecialty care, and to the extent that um, electronic health records gets rolled out, we will be able to have a health information exchange area where we can learn lessons from the patients who are in, in that system. Uh, also, in terms of science, uh, Dr. Stacy Lindau heads a study, a, a family of studies that's called the Southside Health and Vitality Studies. That's uh, population-based research, and, and that will be the back, backbone for us to assess uh, the changes as we uh, try to determine how our interventions impact health or not. And, and lastly, in terms of tra translational science, uh, once we have data that we generate or data that others have, you know, we believe we can work with community to translate that, that research into impacts at the local level. Uh, importantly, you know, on, on the one hand, the Southside Healthcare Collaborative is about healthcare, uh, and the Center for Community Health, in our vision, is about uh, other things that are, I would call more public health in nature, economic development, jobs, education, housing, again, that, that complement to the healthcare that, that uh, leads to a healthy, vibrant uh, urban community. <clears throat> uh, again, this, we're, we're attempting to have a 360 approach to health and wellness. Um, it, the social determinants are important if we're to do that. We're very mindful that this builds on the pillars of an academic health center. In fact, uh, one of the points that Marshall made is one that, that we've, we've internalized, that we have to be a part of the, the fabric of the academic health center and not some community affairs thing that when budgets get uh, tight, it gets cut off. So we, we, we're built on patient care research and education. Uh, in terms of patient care, we now have our doctors out in a number of settings. I talked about the Southside Healthcare Collaborative. We have our physicians and some of our, our medical students and residents now doing training out in, in various community health centers. We have a, a, a medical service at, at a community hospital uh, where the internal medicine department as well as the psychiatric department. Uh, psychiatry has, uh, has a, a lot of effort at. Uh, we also, uh, at a community level, have a subspecialty hub uh, that's really uh, fairly unique in the country where we have 14 subspecialists who see patients on a community base uh, out, out in the community. And uh, we're currently attempting a uh, fashion relationship with Provident Hospital, which is a part of our public system. Uh, and uh, our patient advocates work to link uh, patients throughout the South Side at the site that makes the most sense for both primary and subspecialty care. And again, we, we believe there's a lot of promise with electronic health records as it relates to continuity of care and quality. And this is just gives you a sense of the breadth of the relationships that we've established uh, over probably the last four years. Uh, research is, you know, we're a research institution and, and it, it is an important thing to do to understand what's going on on the ground and hopefully we can start getting at causal relationships and get beyond the correlations. Uh, and importantly, the, the community has to be a, a full partner in, in that process and as I mentioned through the Center for Community Health and Vitality and the Southside Health and Vitality Studies, our, our community has a, a place at the table. Uh, uh, we also believe that when you find out things through the research, we in fact need to go and report out the, the results that we might have and that we approach all of our research with community benefit at the forefront. In terms of the Southside Health and Vitality Studies, we have three major domains that we're working on now. We have asset uh, based mapping that's going on, the so-called environmental mapping, where we, ha we have students and others walking the streets to figure out where the parks are, where the churches are, wh what buildings are there, uh, what services are, are available, uh, and we we you know, how the built environment exists as well as uh, what sort of technology is available. And we're in the midst of planning 
a population-based study that uh, learns from the best of population research around the country. Uh, and, and lastly, one of the things that I think a lot of people are excited about and uh, you know, some, a term that, that uh, has been called data collaboratory, where we take any data that exists about the South Side and, and curate it in a warehouse so that the, the, uh, our community-based organizations and others can tap into it. And we help facilitate the use of that data so that data, you know, the researchers don't use the, the, the data and then put it on a, a disk or in a file and forget about it. Uh, education is the third prong of the mission, and uh, we are, for the first time, in a, in a robust way, getting education out in the community with our docs, as I mentioned earlier, having medical students out. And I don't want to oversell the Office of Community-Based Education. There's only one person in that right now. Uh, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction to pay attention to uh, how education happens on a community base. Uh, uh, medical student debt is a big, big issue. Um, I think our, our indebtedness for medical students on average is about $170,000 to $180,000 a year. Uh, I mean, at, at cumulatively, I should say. Uh, and we, we have a program called the REACH program where we will pay up to $40,000 a year for each of four years or $160,000 if our graduates practice in, in our network on the south side of Chicago. Uh, for both primary care and subspecialty care. So we're, we have three individuals who have taken advantage of that and we hope to expand it as we go along. The, the center is uh, an exciting uh, a new initiative that we have. And again, the premise there is that there are a lot of assets in the community and uh, we need to be asset-based focused. Uh, it, it is the face of our project out in the community and for both research and education and again, making research accessible to community partners uh, and encouraging their participation. But not only having data, but making sure that the data is actionable and we can change policy or create programs and evaluate them for impact. Uh, we've employed a lot of individuals uh, uh, in, in, in our research and we partner with uh, groups that are nearby who are there to, to uh, you know, create employment opportunities for community members. Uh, and, and that's been a nice collaboration uh, with a, a group called CARA that's in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm running out of here because I'm going to our community grand rounds. Uh, so my team is sponsoring uh, community grand rounds tonight on community violence prevention. So I, that's why I'm leaving here. Uh, we had our first uh, community grand rounds uh, last month on mental health services, uh, where the community members participated in a play about uh, a mental health, uh, mental health, and uh, and we brought the best evidence to bear in in terms of mental health and weaved it into a play. And, and also had experts in mental health there to uh, participate in a, a question and answer session. This is part of the, the, the uh, CTS funding that we have at the University of Chicago, and we have a number of community partners who are part of that. All of the topics that are on the right side, mental health, community violence, interpersonal violence, asthma, uh, health issues for seniors, were all of the ones that you see on the right were chosen by community members and not by our, our researchers. So this is what they wanted to hear about. Just to give you a model, as you, you can see the center uh, and the studies, uh, and, and importantly, the residents are in the middle of, the, of, of all of this. So again, if uh, we don't have the residents, we, we need not be doing the rest of this. Uh, and this is Dr. Stacy Lindau, one of our colleagues who uh, it, it went to DC with a group of physicians in December you know, not a, in, a, in a political way, it was a nonpartisan group of doctors who just advocated that, that health reform some, some type uh, needed to happen. And I put this up just to, you know, to amplify the, the work that uh, Dr. Washington talked about. We think there's a great deal of, of uh, potential for the Urban Health Initiative uh, with health care reform related to community health centers, related to prevention, uh, related to health professions workforce, and we, ho we hope to uh, really take advantage of that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm closing out by saying that you know, we've had a, a rocky couple of years uh, when the, our work got wrapped up into presidential politics. Uh, th these are a number of the headlines. Uh, and I do want to say, if you get called by Rush Limbaugh, uh, Glenn Beck, 
or the like, just say no. Don't don't call them back. Uh, it's not worthwhile. Uh, and you know, and now that we've emerged out of pre out of the the, uh, the the presidential race, um, the Chicago Sun Times in in March 2009, and more recently the Sun Times uh, here in Chicago actually said this work is important and something that's that's worthwhile and should be doing, uh, and and should be a model. Now, in terms of lessons learned. Uh, you know, I, community trust is a big thing, and I've, I've spoken all over the country to uh, universities, and, and there's often town down sort of problems with the community. But one of the things that we've learned is that if you have that trust, which is hard earned, uh, it can withstand many shocks, even if you're in the paper and, and bad things are being said about you, but it, it requires con con continuous communication. Uh, and we were benefited by the fact that we built our well before we needed to drink from the, that reservoir, and it, it worked well for us. It also helps that we had a team that's credible to the community, and, and the uh, community leaders and others felt uh, were representative of the community, and, and, uh, had, and therefore it allowed us our work to move forward. Uh, we, we believe in transparency in all of our work. In fact, you can go on a website and find the minutes for nearly every meeting that we have uh, and so that those in the community can know what's going on. Uh, and, and I found that by using all of our assets, not only the intellectual assets of our medical center and our business school and our policy school, uh, but using assets like our political assets where we went to lobby on behalf of hospitals and community health centers where we didn't have a direct benefit, uh, you know, people appreciate that because as the University of Chicago, we do have a lot of assets. And lastly, we have a lot of financial capital uh, that we can fund things and, and support things in a way that others. And, and, and lastly, we've learned that giving credit, credit to others is an important thing and that the university doesn't always need to be at the forefront of things. Uh, so, you know, I, I, as I close, I just always need to thank the funders, um, and, and there have been a number of them. Uh, I was at the AAMC meeting uh, uh, on Sunday and, and went to HHS on Monday and met with uh, a number of leaders and, and who are implementing health care reform. And, and th at the AAMC as well as uh, at, at HHS, they're excited about the infrastructure we're building. The thing I will say is that there's no quick fix to this. This is going to be a lot of uh, tough sledding and hard work over one, two decades. Uh, and we're in this for the long haul. And, and I'm excited about seeing the results. And, and if, if we're lucky, uh, you know, we will uh, make the impact that we, we think we can. So thank you for considering this. And uh, I hope I'm around for questions and answers. Thanks a lot. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Harold Pollock. Dr. Pollock is the Helen Ross Professor at the School of Social Service Administration and Faculty Chair for the Center for Health Administ Administration Studies. He is also co-director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and an associate director of the Clinical and Translational Science Award. And most recently, he has joined the faculty of the McLean Center. Harold is a graduate uh, in electrical engineering and computer science from Princeton and got his PhD in public policy from Harvard. He has published widely at the interface between poverty, policy, and public health. Before coming to SSA, Professor Pollock was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholar in Health Policy Research at Yale University and taught health management and policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Please welcome Dr. Pollock. Uh, I actually, uh, in a sense, I tore up my intended presentation uh, in light of last Tuesday's election. Uh, you, you may not believe me, but I actually did prepare for it today. There, uh, and uh, those, those of us in the room who supported uh, the Affordable Care Act, health reform, or might have been disappointed by the Tuesday's results. Others of us uh, might have been less disappointed. Uh, this being University of Chicago, I think we have both sides well represented. Uh, whatever side you're on in that political dispute, I would say two things are indisputably true and color uh, the way uh, our health policy debate is going to go for a while. Uh, first, we're living through hard times. We really are. Uh, a widespread and chronic joblessness at a level that we haven't seen in decades 
uh, has shaped everything in, in American life within the past couple of years. 47 states are in significant financial difficulty, and the state and local budget crisis is the most critical factor in the mechanics of health reform and in the capacity of state and local governments to implement the responsibilities that they've been given in a very ambitious piece of legislation. Uh, many, uh, many states are laying off teachers, police officers, firefighters. Uh, Kane County, Illinois, close to them, is laying off half of their public health department. Uh, we are, uh, you, uh, you wouldn't know it from the rhetoric in the midterm campaign, but more than 50 million residents of this country lack health insurance, and that number is increasing. Uh, on my own street, there are 22 houses, five of them are empty. Uh, uh, an organization that serves my disabled relative uh, is in financial distress because the state of Illinois isn't paying its bill. There's a waiting list of uh, 21,000 developmentally disabled individuals in Illinois who need services. This is the largest agency in the south side of Chicago and the south suburbs. It's taken eight new clients in the past year from its huge waiting list because there's just no money. Uh, that's the context in which public policy is occurring at the moment across the country. Now second and no less true, we're, we're genuinely blessed in a different way to live in a moment where real history is being made right in front of us. Uh, you know, we often tell our students about the New Deal, the Great Society, moments of historic upheaval. We're actually living in one of those moments right now. And uh, you know, I know history is always being made, but, but rarely so obviously or with the intensity that it is right now. And whether we're referring to the election of the first black president, the passage of health reform, gay marriage, medical marijuana, uh, the rise of the Tea Parties and Sarah Palin, uh, a, a field mouse eating, eating an owl, uh, the Cubs winning the World Series, lots of unexpected things <laughs> seem to be happening. And just a lot of stuff is going on. And that makes uh, my assignment today, my, my talk title is, is, uh, is making it to 2015 especially difficult. I, I feel a little bit like the foreign policy experts who are asked to comment on the Israeli-Palestinian dispute where I think we have a pretty good idea of what it might look like in 2030. What it's going to look like in 2013, no one has any idea. Uh, and I think that 10 years from now, the United States will have substantially fewer uninsured people than we have now. We'll have expanded Medicaid eligibility or something equivalent for poor people. We'll have health insurance exchanges or something very much like them in the lexicon of health reform that offers moderate income people financial support and regulatory protections uh, that are somewhat uh, like what those of us who work for large employers enjoy right now. Uh, so in the long run, we have, we have some understanding of what the contours of the American health system will be. Uh, how we're going to get there is a real mystery. Before 2015, we're going to have two elections. We may have President Obama, we may have President Palin. Uh, some safety net providers within the short bicycle ride of this building will probably go out of business before 2015. Uh, others will expand. Uh, Eric's going to be busy. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, we're, we're, we're in, a wild, in for a wild ride. And it's going to be a wild ride in a time of fiscal crisis and political gridlock in the short run when the most difficult implementation challenges in our healthcare system will have to be resolved. Uh, Hank Aaron, not the baseball player, the health economist, uh, they're different people, um, noted that, that health reform has created some of the largest bureaucratic challenges in American history and it requires a sense of bipartisan goodwill to resolve them. I would say that one, with 100% accuracy, we, I can predict we will not have that bipartisan spirit of goodwill when a lot of those decisions are made, uh, and, this will, uh, and this, will be, uh, uh, this will be a real challenge. Now, I, I, and so I'll, I'll give you some predictions today about what I think will happen, and, I'll t and, uh, uh, and, and the irony of what I think is the most likely path that we're likely to be on. Uh, ironically, there's a kind of self-fulfilling false prophecy that's playing itself out. Uh, Republican and conservative Democrats caricatured the health reform bill as a costly and undisciplined beast, 
Uh, and if it comes to resemble that caricature in the next several years, ironically, it will be because those very same critics are going to work hard to attack the elements of the Affordable Care Act that annoy interest groups and that constrain medical costs. And, and I think that is uh, both Democrats and Republicans face some very serious dilemmas over the next couple of years. And the most likely outcome is that uh, some of the most, uh, uh, some of the elements of health reform that are most aimed at constraining uh, cost growth and disciplining the system are going to be the first ones that we're likely to see eroded. Uh, now, what are some of the dilemmas that Democrats and Republicans face? Democrats face the reality that they just lost their majority. Uh, and in search of a politically feasible and ideologically moderate reform, they passed a very organizationally complicated one that, that the public doesn't seem to like or understand very well. Uh, Democrats also bear the burden of just owning a catastrophic economy. And this is not a talk about, about economics and politics directly, but those obviously cast a long shadow. Now, Republicans have their own dilemmas, which people don't think about quite as much. Uh, I doubt that they're going to be able to, or will choose to, smash the central pillars of health reform over the next couple of years. Uh, if you ask Americans, do you like health reform, sadly for Democrats, the answer tends to be no, not very much. But if you ask people about the specific provisions of health reform, each one in isolation tends to be pretty popular. And the ones that are unpopular tend to be the things that are in there so that the popular ones can actually happen. And so this creates a real dilemma. Uh, so if we're very likely to keep protections for people with pre-existing conditions, health insurance for young adults, uh, uh, expanded coverage. Uh, these measures are really pretty popular uh, in American society. And, and I don't see any real evidence that Republicans are trying to construct an alternative that would really get rid of those things. Uh, now, to keep those things, uh, the Republicans face the dilemma, what do you do about the individual mandate and some of the other elements of health reform that, that, uh, that are actually passionately opposed by the Republican political base and passionately supported by some of the interest groups that are very central elements of the Republican coalition? So if I, I really don't envy John Boehner right now. Uh, uh, I, I think his complexion may turn from orange to white as he tries to manage the collective action problem that uh, pa white isn't pale about to pass out, not white isn't Caucasian. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Republicans have some real dilemmas in what to do. There are some clear non-starters that right now are being talked about in the press that I think we can save a lot of time in, in uh, getting a chuckle and then moving on. Uh, and uh, let me say a few things about Medicaid as one of those issues. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act extends Medicaid to every American with an income below 133% of the poverty line. Uh, I'm a public health researcher. I don't think most Americans appreciate this is a fundamental uh, improvement in our public health infrastructure that we've made Medicaid an income-based program. Uh, and it, it's, this, is, this is going to be very hard to undo and very important. Now, why is this so important? Well, Medicaid right now is a means-tested categorical program. That's the kind of language that immediately causes a layer of narcolepsy to extend over the audience. Uh, you have to be a certain kind of poor person to get Medicaid. Uh, you have to be a kid. You have to be a welfare recipient. You have to be on SSI. Uh, and many poor people of the greatest public health concern are just not eligible for Medicaid. Let me give you an example. Suppose that you walk past Medici's today on the way home, and there's a homeless man who has a drug problem who asks you for a couple dollars. Uh, he's not a veteran. He's not a mom. He doesn't have a qualifying disability, since substance dependence is not a qualifying condition for federal disability programs. Uh, but he might need something like methadone treatment to deal with his addiction. Who's going to pay for that treatment? Right now, that treatment is paid for through a patchwork of state and federal funding streams that really are, are stressed because of the state and local budget crisis I just mentioned, uh, and that uh, also don't cover the fact that he has some physical health problems that also need to be addressed. Uh, every now and then, you come across someone who says, I, just, I know about the drug addicts who, just, who don't have any comorbidities. And my reaction is always, oh, that's where they are, because I never see those people. 
most of the people that I see you know, have, have mental health issues, have physical health issues. So expanding Medicaid, flash forward to 2015 and you think about that same guy. Now he shows up at the methadone clinic and they enroll him in Medicaid. And Medicaid pays for his substance abuse treatment and they can send him to the psychiatrist and to the uh, uh, person to look at his foot problem and it's still covered. That's a huge change. Now, emboldened by last Tuesday's election, some politicians around the country are talking about having their states withdraw from the Medicaid program. Uh, Texas is the one where, where the governor and some of the leading politicians in the state have talked about this. Uh, now, I must say, were it not for the likely human consequences of the attempt, I would say that liberal Democrats are hoping that they try this. Uh, this is so politically, economically, and administratively ill-advised that I think the term self-immolating would be a good description of the political strategy behind that. Uh, and let me, let me say a few things about that. Uh, in pure dollar terms, right now the federal government pays for 70% uh, of Texas's Medicaid program. Now some of that is because of the stimulus, but uh, uh, in normal times uh, the federal government pays for more than 60% of, of Texas's Medicaid. And in fact, uh, the federal government will pay virtually the entire tab for people made newly eligible for Medicaid under health reform. Uh, now what makes Texas nervous are all the people who are eligible right now who are not being served but who might sign up for the program. And that's a, that's a fiscal issue that the state has to face. Uh, but if Texas withdraws from the Medicaid program, they somehow would have to explain where the $24 billion they're now getting from the federal government, where, how they would replace that. Uh, there's some, uh, some people who claim that they found a way to make the budget numbers work, which seems highly doubtful to me. Uh, but even if they could, balancing the budget is only one issue in play. Uh, Medicaid is hardwired within the payment systems and the financial model of not only thousands of medical providers, but also nonprofit agencies, schools that provide Medicaid-funded services, uh, and more. And if you withdrew $24 billion from this ecosystem, no one can say exactly what would happen except the one predictable consequence would be you would provoke the most determined backlash from a highly organized group of very unhappy people. Uh, and one more thing that, that's pertinent, which is um, I think when people think about Medicaid, they tend to think about poor people, right? You tend to think about, in Texas, you tend, who do you think of as a Medicaid recipient? A poor kid, maybe who's a child of immigrants. Uh, you tend to... Uh, uh, Think about politically marginal people. When it would be sad if those people were hurt by budget cuts, but uh, we sort of think of those of people as relatively marginal in American politics. Uh, and that's because we have a level of cognitive dissonance about what our government actually does. Uh, if you ask Americans uh, about what we think about government, at the most general level, we are very strong believers of, in limited government. At the same time, we actually support particular programs that serve ourselves and the people that we want to help. And it turns out that 60% of the dollars that the Texas Medicaid program pays goes to the elderly and to the disabled. And so uh, you might expect that withdrawing from the Medicaid program would produce some ardent but ineffective protests from, from traditional Democratic constituencies and some other rather weak uh, groups. Uh, I think some of those legislators might suddenly get to meet some surprisingly angry good old boys who are wandering in and asking, hey, what happened to the nursing home that's taking care of my mom? And how come my cousin's autistic child suddenly can't get services at the local high school? And these guys are armed. This is Texas. <laughs> you don't, uh, uh, so so uh, uh, one of the challenges that the Republicans face is a lot of the things that are in health reform uh, in terms of the numbers, maybe helping a lot of poor people, but in terms of the dollars, are helping a lot of the people, maybe not the people in this room, but people that are surprisingly close to a lot of the people in this room. And so uh, if, you, if you try to constrain those programs, for better or for worse, you discover there's some very powerful middle class constituencies behind it. So, so, uh, uh, so that's a long way of saying a lot of the things that, that uh, the Tea Party folks are talking about right now are really not going to happen once the immediate euphoria of their victory fades. Uh, now, now what, what will happen? Instead of something that drastic, I think two things are likely to happen. One is there'll be lots of hearings in the House of Representatives. Uh, and we'll get to find out all the embarrassing things about health reform that the administration is not doing well that can be investigated. 
Uh, and second, there'll be an effort to try to erode the elements of health reform that are not that popular, particularly the things that were put in the bill because they needed to get the budget numbers to work. Uh, and uh, which brings us to another irony, which is the demographic transition that's happening within both American political parties. The Republican political base in the midterms was pretty much senior citizens uh, who voted for Republicans by 20 points. Uh, and uh, so one can imagine the House of Representatives making some pretty serious attacks on some of the elements of health reform that curb Medicare Advantage and some of the other elements that seniors are not fond of. Uh, perhaps the Cadillac Insurance Tax and the Independent Payment Advisory Board. This is the alphabet soup of health reform. But they're basically things that are regarded as the medicine that you have to take to make health reform work. And it's a kind of a sad lesson for not just for Democrats, but actually for a lot of the Republican policy wonks, which is that paying for stuff in general is not a good political strategy. Uh, Medicare Part D, uh, which was the previous big health measure, imposed a, a, uh, an unfunded liability larger than the Social Security system, and it's, it's pretty popular. Uh, health reform reduced the deficit, but it did so in ways that got people pretty upset and is a lot less popular. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that's a sad lesson that is bipartisan. A lot of the elements of health reform that are unpopular are things that Republicans favor as well as Democrats. Uh, now, let me, let me uh, say some things about political sustainability. I actually think had the framers of health reform thought about political sustainability with the same diligence that they thought about a lot of the policy wonkery, we would have had better politics and probably in the end crafted better policy than we're likely to see. Uh, it's not that I think that, that uh, people were naive and that led to uh, designing a bill that was unpopular, which led to the midterm defeat for the Democrats, but I think that Democrats might have predicted that that midterm defeat was coming and designed the bill in a way that, that could have weathered the storm better than, than it's likely to. I'm now reading, there's a terrific book by Eric Patochna called Reforms at Risk which talks about what happens to reforms after they are passed, and why are some sustainable and some not. Uh, some of the issues are obvious. Health reform is very backloaded. Uh, um, it does not create an immediate visible difference in enough people's lives to create enough political momentum for it right now. And there's going to be two elections before it really does affect the daily lives of millions of Americans the way that that once it does, will make it a permanent feature of American life. Uh, there's, uh, right now the activities under health reform are about 5% of what they will be in, in six years. So a lot of the stuff just hasn't happened yet and people don't see uh, uh, whether it's a good thing or not. Uh, for example, there's a program for pre-existing conditions which has been funded for $5 billion from now until three and a half years from now. And it turns out that the need for this program is probably three or four times what's been budgeted in that program. Uh, so the, the backloading was a serious mistake. I also uh, note that there's some other things that are less obvious than, it, than the backloading. Uh, by the way, if they had put more money up front, it also could have provided some stimulus to the economy, which might have been nice. You're seeing all these state and local employees being laid off who could be doing things to improve public health. Sorry. That's just to keep you awake. There, um, uh, and I, I think that's, that's really too bad because a lot of the provisions are really so important. Uh, I mentioned the Medicaid provision. There are many others I don't have time to discuss, but I'll just simply say that health reform, it's the most important AIDS policy. It's more important than any AIDS strategy ever published in America. It's the most important drug policy, which is a pretty low bar, but it's, the most, it's more important than any drug policy ever published, illicit drug policy, that is, in the United States. Uh, there's a, in terms of disparities, Marshall mentioned disparities, uh, there's some accumulating evidence that universal coverage will be very helpful in reducing some of the key disparities. It won't reduce all the disparities because there's a lot of social determinants of health that health reform can't address. Kids are getting shot in the city of Chicago right now. Giving people Medicaid cards is not going to solve that problem. But a lot of the basic issues in cardiovascular health turn out to be uh, it turns out that universal coverage is very helpful. Uh, 30 years ago, the Rand Health Insurance Experiment gave some people free health care and some people the equivalent of a catastrophic health care plan. 
And the, the poor people in the free care plan had a 38% lower mortality rate. And the basic reason for that was that they had better control of their hypertension because they went to the doctor more often. If you hurt your knee and you go to the doctor, your doctor's probably not going to help your knee much. That's sort of the dirty secret of medical care. But it will take your blood pressure, and that's a good thing. And similarly, people have looked at race, ethnic, educational disparities in the Medicare program. And what happens to people when they go from age 62, 63, 64 to age 65? And it turns out that there's, a, that there's some pretty dramatic reductions in racial disparities in, in basic measures. Systolic blood pressure, racial disparities drop by 60% at age 65. Disparities in blood glucose control and diabetes decline by 75%. Educational disparities in total cholesterol become negligible, and some of the Latino white disparities actually start to flip, and you see a favorable impact where Hispanics have better indicators than non-Hispanic whites do. And the Medicare program is not a particularly well-tuned program for prevention, but it does get people into the doctor. Uh, the new law will require insurers to cover without cost sharing evidence-based preventive services. I'll just, it's a late on a Friday, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll say that there's this thing called the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. How many of you have heard of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force? How many of, how many of you raised your hand just because you wanted me to think that you're smart? <laughs> uh, so the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, uh, it turns out that any, any uh, service that gets an A or a B rating from this group of experts has to be covered by insurers without a co-payment. And what's, uh, 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 what's remarkable about that is a, a lot of the services that we in the public health community fought for actually have good ratings from the Preventive Services Task Force. For example, screening for alcohol disorders in the emergency room. Uh, it turns out that's been hard to get insurance companies to pay for, but it has a B rating. So now the insurers have to pay for it starting in 2011. Uh, and what's interesting about that is we don't have to litigate these anymore on an insurer by insurer basis or issue by issue. It's an organizational change that says here's this, this organization, the Preventive Services Task Force, which is empowered to, to make public health policy in a way that's, that's pretty entrenched. Now contrast that to something that was less politically adroit, which is there's a nice new preventive uh, prevention and Public Health Fund, which I and others were very happy to see funded. Turns out there's $15 billion in this fund over the next decade. Uh, we were very happy about that. There's one problem with that, which is that it is solely dependent on congressional appropriation. If you want to make something permanent, you cannot make it vulnerable to the whims of a future congressional majority. This is exactly the kind of provision which is most likely to be cut. And in fact, already in the last Congress, uh, there was a Republican measure put in to eliminate the, this fund and to use it to finance uh, a measure that would reduce paperwork on small business. Uh, and that was how it's right. I can't read what that says. Me? Okay. So let me um, uh, let me finish on a, on a on a positive way, which is we spend a lot of time in public health saying, how can we come up with good arguments that convince people prevention is important. And the truth is we've already convinced people prevention is important, but the good arguments are not really what we need. We need to create constituencies and interest groups and organizations that will make, that will give some momentum behind the things that we do. And if we want to be successful moving forward to 2015, we have to find ways to entrench what we do in a more sustained way. We've done that with tobacco taxes, by the way, because states need the money, but we haven't done that with some other things. Uh, and I think if there's one positive element right now, ironically, it's that Republicans have won a lot of state houses in America. Uh, I think that President Obama and uh, Representative Speaker Boehner will have a very hard time finding ways to cooperate. Uh, but I think there's a lot of Republican governors who have some common interest with, with President Obama looking forward, who really have a stake in health reform working. And if I were to bet my money on where bipartisanship in the next four years will be most surprising and most successful, it will be uh, in the partnerships that the president and governors can create to get this done, to deal with the state and local budget crisis, to transfer some money to states that need it, and to create a platform that will make health reform successful. So, uh, so I'll stop there, but thank you very much.
Our last speaker for the panel is uh, Dr. Preston Reynolds. Preston is professor in geriatrics and palliative care in the Department of General Medicine at the University of Virginia. Preston has served as full-time faculty at Johns Hopkins University, University of Pennsylvania, and Eastern Virginia Medical School, where she held the position of Chief of General Medicine, Vice Chair for Education of the Department of Medicine, and Associate Director of the Center for Generalist Medicine. Preston's area for research for more than 30 years has focused on the history of race discrimination in healthcare and medical education. She has published and lectured on the subject, received major funding from the NIH and other national foundations, and won awards for her scholarship. In 2010, the American College of Physicians honored Dr. Reynolds with the 2010 National Advocacy in Healthcare Reform. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Reynolds. So uh, I'm going to share with you why I was so passionate about reauthorizing Title VII, what I thought the promise of it was, and I'm going to leave you with some concerns, because it's me. Because I am concerned that the promise of health reform will not be realized, and I'll tell you why uh, when we finish. And part of this is uh, having direct experience advocating for many of the provisions of the ACA post-voting, uh, like post uh, post-success. So let me start. Uh, as you can see, health disparities are one aspect of the quality crisis in the United States. And other countries, without question, outperform us on every quality measure. As you can see, Canada rates fifth in terms of equity largely because of the denial of access to services to their indigenous uh, Indian population. This country uh, has a legacy of discrimination in healthcare, and I think if we fail to remember that, we will fail to achieve um, some of the goals that our earlier speakers spoke of in terms of health equity and justice. But denial to training um, was really the reality of African Americans up until the mid 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And it was a problem not only in the South. Uh, the first medical student, black medical student, was admitted to the University of Arkansas, not until 1948. Uh, it was not until 1963 that, 63, that Duke admitted its first black, black medical student. So denial training for nurses, dentists, physicians was widespread throughout this country. More extreme in the South than in the North, but it was prevalent um, in all regions, in all corners. But race discrimination did not only happen in health professions training, it also happened in access to health services. Blacks were absolutely denied care, even under emergency conditions, in Chicago hospitals, Birmingham hospitals, Tuskegee hospitals, hospitals all over this country. And if they were admitted, they were admitted to segregated wards, basement wards, attic wards, separate buildings, often that were dilapidated, worn out and underfunded. And this really didn't change, as Marshall had teed me up, this really didn't change until the regulations to implement Medicare were put in place under President Johnson in the summer of 1966. Really, well, I, I could argue one train of thought, which is overnight, the racial template of American medicine and health professions training changed. But in reality, it probably took another decade for the regulations to really become embedded. That was then. This is now. And I want to ask you to think about this question. What skills will clinicians need to care for the next generation of Americans who already reflect far greater diversity than the current mix of health professionals? 2010 census data was talked about at the recent AAMC meeting that Eric talked about by the new CEO of diversity of the AMC, And as he said, the cohort of Americans under the age of 18, already 25% report high health illiteracy. 32% report being in the lowest income group. And these youth are predominantly Hispanic and black. So Title VII has been dedicated to really promoting primary care careers. But why is this important if we have a conference on health disparities? I think the data is irrefutable that primary care workforce reduces health disparities. 
And the data is becoming even more clear that when care is delivered in the patient-centered medical home, disparities are, they just don't exist. There are reduced costs for care of patients with the same disease by primary care physicians compared to specialists. And at the same time, there's improved quality with lower mortality and lower morbidity. Why increase diversity? Well, we know from the data that underrepresented minorities are more likely to care for disadvantaged and vulnerable. They're more likely to care for minorities. And more importantly, and more significantly, there's no implicit bias, which is the subconscious way our minds work in making decisions that we think are rational and evidence-based, but in fact, in many cases, are driven by our subconscious values and attitudes. And there are studies now that show that medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, medical residents and practicing physicians, when you look at minorities and students and clinicians of mixed race, there is no implicit bias in their decision making and their decision about the delivery of clinical care. When you look at white physicians, white students, white nursing students, white residents, there is a bias against minorities and it has significant impact in the delivery of both ambulatory and hospital-based services. So I'll talk to you today about Title VII's contributions to creating the primary care infrastructure and capacity I believe it's a major federal mechanism to provide skills in the care of vulnerable and disadvantaged. It's the major mechanism to increase diversity in the health professions with tangible outcomes. And it's a major mechanism to create pipeline and faculty retention programs. And it's because of this history, because of this data, I then argued and worked so hard to get it reauthorized. But Title VII is a package of programs. It's not one. And it really is designed to develop the pipeline from K through 12 all the way through graduation to the practicing physician. This is the program I used to run, the Title VII Training in Primary Care Medicine Dentistry Grant Program, which I'll talk the most about. This is AHEX. These are based, state-based. They develop pipeline programs. They create community-based clerkships for health professional students in nursing, dentistry, and medicine. They develop continuing education programs for health professionals, and they tie all of this together in an integrated network. This is Health Careers Opportunities Program. Inside HRSA, federal data shows this program has the highest impactor. The dollars going in to train students to enter the health professions result in more students actually enter them than any other program. This is the National Service Corps, and these are rural interdisciplinary training programs. When I was here as a fellow, I started working on this. I had, I had run the federal program, Title VII, for several years. I came out and was invited to put together a special theme issue of academic medicine. And so much of the next year and a half was actually putting together these sets of articles, writing several of them, commissioning other them, some of them from other leaders. Uh, and I think this actually had traction on the Hill when the health reform bill was being written. So as I shared with you last year when we talked about the history of this program and was it relevant to include in health reform, I laid out four eras. I'm not going to talk about phase one, which was capacity building. In those 12 years, we built 40 medical schools and increased training positions by order of 15,000. But as I shared with you before, this period was really the transition in the racial integration of health professions training. So while we increased capacity, we were still largely a white profession on the outcome of that phase. Phase two is what I'm going to start with. It's a landmark legislation in 1976, the Health Professions uh, Training Act. Uh, there were three pieces of legislation in this phase of 15 years. And the portfolio of programs that we now think of primary care, which is family medicine residencies, departments of residencies, divisions of general medicine, primary care med medicine training programs, general pediatric training programs, PA profession, nurse practitioners, all of these programs were really built in these 15 years. By the end of uh, 1991, we had finished uh, building out the training in primary care medicine dentistry portfolio. 
with pre-doctoral curriculum in medicine and physician assistants, residency training in medicine and dentistry, and faculty development in medicine. What does Title VII do? There's no other federal program like it. It provides salary support to individuals to create new curricula, new training experiences, new collaborative partnerships with community organizations, um, to create rule-based training tracks, um, to strengthen and support administrative infrastructure, to disseminate findings and outcomes. Uh, it provides medical student stipends for summer experiences and fellowship stipends for fellows to get MPHs, Masters of Education, and Masters in Clinical Science. So as a consequence, what was the outcome of this first 15-year phase? Well, there were over almost 100 departments of medicine created with federal funding. There were 390 family medicine residencies. Uh, there were 12 in 1969 when family medicine was created, and by the end of 1991, there were 390. There are 51 new general dental residencies, uh, and ambulatory curriculum and training and faculty development was widespread through nearly every medical school in this country. But I'd like us to appreciate the dollars that went into creating this infrastructure because it has enormous impact on the conversation today. And as you can see, in, in, 19, in 2009 dollars, residency training in family medicine, for this 15-year period alone, was 411 million. Establishment of departments of family medicine, the federal government infused 129 million. Residency training in general medicine, general pediatrics, another 144 million in 2009 dollars. And PA training and dental assistant training, 268 million. Those are huge dollars. Today, they would have an enormous impact. So let's just look at residency training alone. And these are the dollars for family medicine residency training, 750 million over a 10-year period. If you figure that, a grant, you know, having 75 million just for residency training in family medicine today, you would think that we were rolling in cash. Um, and you can see why we ended up with 390 uh, family medicine residencies if we're fusing this much money into the system. Similarly with general medicine and general pediatrics. So much so that by the end of this decade, general medicine has been retained as a specialist within internal medicine. And this is the era of the doubling, tripling of NIH budget every single year. So the drive to specialization is going on at a rapid, rapid pace. And yet Title VII is buffering that. It's allowing the workforce to still retain a diversity and a primary care emphasis. This is really striking when you look at the PA program. In 1973, 39 out of 41 PA programs received Title VII funding. And every Title VII funded grantee had to concentrate on primary care ambulatory based training. It's no surprise that 75% of PAs by in the first 25 years actually went into primary care partnering with family physician, a general internist, or a general pediatrician. And as the number of programs continued to grow and the dollars remained stable, their impact on PA training diminished year by year, so that now the majority of PAs continue to do something in primary care, but the great, it's almost now 50-50 with them going into specialty care. Phase three, and this is the era that I know best. The program was changed completely, and the new emphasis is on training skills and care of vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. Uh, we have two major pieces of legislation, uh, and as you can see, every grantee, every program, every discipline is now required by the grant guidance to address a major indis indicator on Healthy People 2010 which means all of them have to address some aspect of health disparities. They have to create clinical and training programs that target these vulnerable populations that are specified in the legislation. These funds were used to develop evidence-based medicine, palliative care, and after the Surgeon General's report came out that said early dental caries and dental disease leads to long-term morbidity and mortality, oral health became a grant guidance priority. 
When I was there, we added cultural competency, health literacy, professionalism, and patient safety quality improvement. So you can either look at the glass half full, the glass half empty. If it's glass half full, the dollars are going down when adjusted by inflation. If you look at a glass half up, they're, stay, they're actually increasing in, in you know, hard numbers. But the bottom line is funding stayed stable in the 1990s and the early, de early years of this decade. So much so that every year there were about 120 awards granted. This cycle, 37 were awarded with half the amount of money available. When I ran the program, Title VII was the largest grant portfolio in all of HRSA. I had 456 grantees. So much so that this program was having an impact. Even though the dollars were diminished, they were still infusing money to promote primary care. At the same time, we had four to five million dollars available to issue national contracts and cooperative agreements, and I'll talk about a couple of those because this is another place where Title VII was having an impact on creating an infrastructure around primary care. So what were the outcomes of phase three? Clearly increased diversity, clearly increased competence and outreach to vulnerable and underserved populations, clearly new curricula in health disparities, faculty development and fellowships with fellows doing research in health disparities um, and inequities. National contracts, we'll talk about a couple of those. In fact, there were 35 national contracts issued during this period. So here's some data. Title VII programs graduated four to seven times more minority and disadvantaged students uh, than the national average. Um, Graduates of Title VII programs were two to four times more likely to practice in medically underserved communities with disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. And that's in every program, the residency training, the PAs, et cetera, et cetera. This is another study that was done by the Graham Center uh, in Washington, D.C., looking at the factors that influence student and resident choices. And they wanted to look at the impact of debt, national service course scholarship, exposure to primary care and medical school, Title VII funding to a school, salary differential between specialists and generalists, public medical school versus personal on a student's career choice. And what they did is they matched uh, data from the AMA master file with the funding history, HRSA's funding history of that program, and then data from the AAMC graduation questionnaire. And what they found is that this study affirmed the positive relationship between Title VII exposure <laughs> and most of our study outcomes despite severe reductions in Title VII funding. And what were those? Career choice as a family physician is, number, is on the top. Career choice as a primary care physician. Practice in a rural area. Practice in a federally quality health center. Practice in a community health center. Practice in a rural health center. So I could go down the list, but you can see that Title VII is having a positive impact on those things that we believe are at the root of improving health disparities. This comes from the 2006 report of the Advisory Committee on Training in Primary Care Medicine and Dentistry, which devoted its report to Title VII in care of disadvantaged and vulnerable. And as you can see, the great majority of grantees are doing some work addressing a title, a 2010 health indices and they are improving access in significant ways. When I ran the program, I was asked to contribute to an HHS report on you know, what we're doing to care for the homeless. So I queried the Title VII grantees and I said, what are you guys doing in terms of curricula and clinical outreach to homeless populations? I got 75 responses back saying, we're doing all kinds of things you know, as part of separate electives, core curriculum, health disparities programs, and service learning activities. But what was stunning to me is only four of those grantees were actually getting funded at that moment in time to actually do those programs, which said to me is that earlier funding had built the infrastructure for this kind of an initiative, and those grantees continued them after the funding had ceased. Let's talk a little about, about medical student, resident, faculty, and then we'll close um, with where we go from here. National contracts. American Medical Student Association, the largest medical student organization in the country, received a number of them. These are two of them. One was Prime, six-year contract, 
Ten grants were, give, grants were given to ten schools specifically to develop curricula in cultural competency and care of vulnerable populations. What really came out of that was a learner's guide and lessons learned on how to implement these curricula and the insight that bringing faculty on board from the beginning was probably the most important thing in terms of achieving success. The um, ADAM contract, Achieving Diversity in Medicine and Dentistry, was probably the first effort at the pre-doctoral level for medicine and dentistry to come together collaboratively, develop pipeline programs and community-based interventions, as well as to implement collaboratively curricula in cultural competency. This was a study that was published in the 2008 Academic Medicine Theme Issue, a study done by Alex Green and Joe Betancourt, where they did a national survey of residents, uh, randomly selected in family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, and what they found, half were in title signed in front of residencies and half were not. They surveyed, they had 28 items on their uh, Likert uh, response questionnaire, and what they found is that residents who were trained in Title VII funded programs were much more skilled in delivering culturally competent care. And here you see the data that they publish in their report, and p-value of <coughs> less than 0 0.05 in six out of the 10 areas. These are two articles on faculty development also published in that same theme issue. Tom DeWitt and Tina Chang talked about the impact of Title VII funding on the development of pedi academic pediatrics and that pediatric fellowship programs were now enabled to give money to their fellows to do MPHs and Masters of Clinical Science and all of them were doing research on vulnerable populations in their catchment area. This is a wonderful study by Ellen Beck and Diane Wingard, uh, and they developed a program at USD, which was three one-week intensive faculty development program over a six-month period between 1999 and 2003, and then in 2003, with their sub subsequent Title VII grant, they expanded this and added a one-year fellowship. By 2008, 107 participants had uh, from 29 states and Puerto Rico. And this is data from their first cohort of 50 faculty who participated in this intensive program devoted to training them just on the care of vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. And as you can see, there were 16 underrepresented minorities, 29% more of, spent more than 50% of their time working with underserved. 19 of them developed new curriculum for students, 30 for residents, 29 had created modified community rotations, 29 were PIs or co-PIs of research grants, 11 of which had been approved and 6 were pending, and 35 had taken on new leadership roles. So we now enter into era 4, and the question was, was Title VII going to be reauthorized with the health, for, health reform legislation, and what would it look like? Um, this is what it looks like. They retained the commitment to the medically underserved community preference, which is if 50% of your graduates serve in medically underserved communities, you get a special priority uh, for funding. There's the primary care priority, the diversity priority, collaborative priority, as well as an emphasis on vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. And a continuation for curricula and cultural competency and patient safety quality improvement. There are now five-year grants with absolute explicit requirements for outcomes. And Marshall said, you know, we do a lot of this stuff, but is it effective on the downstream? Does it change patient outcomes? And that's what these grantees are now supposed to show. There are new priorities for the patient-centered medical home, linkages with community health centers, and for the first time in 40 years, no disciplinary preference. But what's also important is that the minority programs were reauthorized with the legislation. And John Maupin and Wayne Riley, president of Morehouse and Meharry, wrote a commentary for the theme issue. And they talked about the absolute dependence of historically black universities, colleges, and historically black health profession schools on Title VII funding. Uh, and they really argued that eliminating these programs um, would really put this country in jeopardy of having a diverse workforce. So the recommendations for funding for the tri tri 
primary care training uh, and medicine dentistry program. The advisor committee in 2003 recommended 198 million, 2004, 109 million, 2006, 215 million. The ACA actually reauthorizes the program, but our request was 125 million. Why? We thought we could get this. We absolutely thought we could get this. And what I'll show you is, if we had gotten this, this would have been huge. <laughs> Here's the budget. Here's the 2011 budget. Okay, so I come in here and I have 88 million to work with. That's a fair amount of money to, to work with. Rita, Wilma, Katrina, Hurricanes came in and congressional budgets were slashed. These are discretionary programs. They all got slashed, as you can see. The original number coming out for my program was 28 million. Before we got finished, I had gotten it up to 40.8 40 million. But you can see, since 2005, since, all, since this period of the hit, we really haven't done all that well. We're still struggling. So if you had given me 125 million instead of my 54 million, that would have meant three times the amount of grants that I could issue. And I believe that Title VII, again, would begin to have a footprint on American medical education. So I think the jury's, I don't, I, I'm not certain what phase four is gonna be, whether it's gonna be a watered down phase three because we have insufficient funding, or whether we're gonna build the dollars back up and actually make a difference. And why is this important? Because residents aren't choosing primary care, and they're especially not choosing it in internal medicine. And without these dollars, I'm afraid that we will not be able to sustain the primary care workforce that I think is essential to deliver high quality, low cost, equitable health care in this country. So eliminating health disparities remains a national priority and there is no other program, I believe, that is designed or able to develop the clinical skills of health professionals to care for vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. This program has enjoyed strong, strong bipartisan support from its origins in 1976 with Ted Kennedy on the Senate side and Paul Rogers, a Republican, on the House side. But with the November 2010 elections reflecting an American public that wants fiscal restraint, will Congress guard America's safety net or have we arrived at the station and are being asked to get off the train and find our own way? And I really will leave you with this question. Without Title VII driving curriculum and the training of America's future health professionals, will health disparities worsen? Thank you.